We're going to start this puppy up. Clear? Prop? And welcome back to Tip of the Week, Building the Afforda Plane. This week, we're going to accomplish two objectives. One is to work on the rear part of the fuselage, building the diagonal bracing out of one inch tubing, and we'll also form brackets that will support that tubing. And then also, we're gonna hear from a guest who's going to show us how to create a unique tool that will be very effective and useful in the rest of our building with the Afforda plane because there are so many tubes. Very simple tool, but I think you'll get a, a good kick out of it. So without any further ado, let's get started. Our plans call for making four of these brackets. Now they're supposed to be two inches wide. I've made mine two and a half. That gives a little bit extra room for the two pipes that go in here, the two tubes. We'll see that in a moment. But basically, I started off with one of these. This is a square one and a quarter all the way around because we need one inch inside. So. The walls of this are 1 8 inch as per the plans. So how did I make this? I simply cut off one of the sides. With this line here, I used my band saw and just cut all the way through with one fell swoop. It was no problem. Followed my line and that cut off the edge here and left us with this. So let's go make four of these. To make nice round corners, this is all we have to do. and then off to the Scotch-Brite wheel to shine that all up. Now we have to prepare these brackets for installation. So on the back, I drew a center line. And using millimeter rulers makes things real easy because the numbers are nice and small. So it's easy to see that this is about 30 millimeters across, so the center line's at the 15 mark. So, drew a center line. Then we're going to have four rivets, and we want an edge distance of a half inch. So the first one is a half inch, and the last one is a half inch from the edge, and then the two other ones just happen to work out real nicely at about spaces or intervals of half inch. So there's my four. I'm going to set up all of my four brackets doing this. And the reason is now is I'm going to drill right here with my number eighth inch drill bit, number 30 eighth inch drill bit through these. Eventually these will be three sixteenths holes, but we always start small with pilot holes first. Continuing our preparation, we want to find the center line from left to right and draw our vertical line. And then we want to mark two locations. This location is a half inch from the top and a half inch from the side. Same with this one, half inch from the top, half inch from the side. These are going to be the locations of the bolts that go through. Mm -hmm. 
we are going to install our first bracket on the bottom tail 1x2 member. We have, of course, previously marked the location of where this bracket is to go, and we've also marked a center line so we know the center from top to bottom. My bracket is ready, four holes drilled in the bottom. Those are just 1 8 inch holes, and of course the two holes that we did the drill press through, through the sides. So I'm simply going to line this up, and by the way, I also marked a center location from left to right on the bracket itself. I'm going to line up that center mark with the center line here, and look for the center line here through the holes in the bottom of the bracket. And once that is in position, I'm going to mark one of the end holes very carefully, which should appear right on the line. And then I can drill that hole, put a Clico in, and then match drill the rest of the holes. I drilled the one hole along the line. Now I can take my bracket and a Clico. I'll insert it into the end hole. And then into our new hole. And with that firmly in place, I can continue drilling the other three holes right through the brackets so I get it all nice and lined up and have four matched holes. Now we want to drill all of the four holes that attach to the tube to a number 12 drill bit. Now number 12 is pretty close to 3 16 but since we're inserting rivets in here we must use a number 12 drill bit which is several thousandths larger than a 3 16 If you don't use a number 12 you're going to have trouble getting the rivets in. And after drilling your number 12 hole, make sure before you go any further that your 3 16 stainless steel rivet will fit and that you got the right size and it should go in. Now we want to continue drilling the rest of these and we can insert this in right before we pull the last Clico out so we have something to hold it nice and steady while we drill. After drilling all four through, we want to deburr both sides of our bracket and the top. Okay, now we are going to rivet this on using our stainless steel rivets and a rivet gun. If you're new to riveting, you should actually experiment and test one. Here's a rivet, and I drilled a number 12 hole in a piece of scrap and riveted it in place just so you could see what it looks like in the inside here when you pull the rivet. These are called pulled rivets, used to be called pop rivets, because you basically pull them from one side only. Also called blind rivets, because you don't need to get to the back side here in order to install the rivet. You only need to be on one side that's as opposed to solid riveting, which you need access to both the front and the back to install. These 3 16 rivets are actually very hard to pull as far as strength goes. They're stainless steel, the rivets. The aluminum rivets are much easier. I should also note that they make 3 16 Clicos. That's this gold color one here, as opposed to the copper colored for the 1 8 so what's valuable here is that we can use these 3 16 Clicos in our 3 16 holes, which we just drilled. And what that will 
allow us to do is to temporarily install our bracket in place just to make it a little easier when we go and rivet or drill. The rivet needs to be seated always all the way in, all the way down to the surface. Don't ever try and squeeze it if the rivet is sticking above because you'll be in trouble there. You'll have to start over and drill it out. So always make sure the rivet is down all the way. If it needs more force, push it down in or re-drill the hole. And then when you put your riveting tool on, it must also be all the way down. And every time you have to re-squeeze, because you're going to keep squeezing until the stem breaks off, it'll pop. That's where it got the name Pop Rivet. That's a trade name. But we always want to be all the way down against the surface. So every squeeze pulls it a little further. These 316 stainless steel require quite a bit of force, of strength. If you have a pneumatic rivet gun, that makes it really easy because the power of the air pressure pulls it very quickly. And that snap is what broke the stem off, and you can then see what the final outcome looks like. And we're going to repeat that then for the other four holes. Now this type of riveter has a lot more power to it. So for your stainless steel 3 16 this is a much better unit. Now the idea is that you have a lot more strength going this way than you do in a uh, gripping your hands together like that. So the only disadvantage is that the distance between your work and behind it needs to be such that you can get in there, which won't be too much of a problem with what we're working on in the tail. But the nose pieces are replaceable uh, with the different sizes. But the most important thing is that if you read the description of whatever riveter you're looking at, it will say whether it's for stainless steel and up to 3 16 size or not. The other hand ones I was showing you in previous videos were not made for stainless steel up to 316. So you are looking at stressing them greatly unless you get a unit that is uh, made to do that. So this was not super expensive. I think this was 30 some dollars, something like that. Certainly is still less than going uh, pneumatic with an air type riveter. That would be like this one here. Now, if you're doing lots and lots and lots of riveting, then this makes sense. These are more like $100, give or take, and they need an air compressor. But for our project here, a hand riveter is just fine, as long as it's made to pull stainless steel up to 3 16 rivets. I think this one will even go up to a quarter inch, but we don't have any need for that on this project. I should also point out that when selecting the proper rivet for the job, the plans will specify whether it's aluminum or stainless steel, in this case stainless steel, and will also specify the diameter. So they specified 3 16 What you need to think about though is the length of the rivet. That's how long it is. That's the grip length. And that depends on what you're going through as far as how thick it is. So in this example, we're holding a 1 8 inch bracket that we made to a 1 8 inch rectangular tube. So this rivet needs to grip 1 8 inch plus 1 8 inch or a quarter inch. So the minimum gripping ability for the rivet we need to use here has to be at minimum 1 quarter inch. It could be greater right it could grab something longer as we pull the rivet it will shrink down but the minimum gripping has to be in this example one quarter inch so when you purchase rivets it's very clear that they're going to basically ask those three questions 
the material, the diameter, and the grip range, minimum to maximum. They'll also ask about the head, and we want just the standard dome head in this example. There are other rivets that are made to go flat, but you would then have to countersink the material for it to go flat. So we just want dome rivets because they set with a very light minor dome on top of the surface. Now we can go finish the other four just like this. Okay, we're going to show how we installed one of the diagonals between two brackets because they all kind of work the same. First is make sure we're working with the proper tubing. Plans call for one inch and 35 thousandths wall thickness, 0.035. And that is where it's real nice to have your caliper in hand to double check that you got a one inch and the 35 thousandths wall thickness. Which is about as close as you're going to get. All right. Now let's lay the pipe. In fact, I cut the pipe slightly longer than it needs to be so that we have some working room to trim the ends. And let's focus down on our first location. For now, I have the pipe laying on top of the edge of the tube. Now our goal is to get this hole to come through the center of the pipe. Our one requirement is that this hole that we drill in the tube has to be at least a half inch from the edge. Can be greater but at least half inch. So I have the angle in place and if I slide the tube down keeping an idea of where the hole is. Here's the hole and I'm going to slide it down. What we find, and I'm just working around the camera here to make this work, is that somewhere in here is a great place for the tube. There's the hole and I slide it over. We're going to need to cut this area off so that it can sit flat down here and this edge here will about come up to the center line which is half the distance because we're going to leave room for the one coming from the other direction. So what I'm going to do is picture where this hole comes out which is clearly more than a half inch and then I'm going to make my line right in here approximately and I'm going to go grind this down with my sandpaper and come back and take a look at what I got. Little trial and error but for the most part by imagining removing this area here we can get that hole to come through in a nice spot around here and that's all we need to do. And we can deburr this, clean it up. Notice that when this sits inside, that'll be very nice. Now notice where the hole is. That's where the hole will be drilled once we place this inside the bracket. But that should put the hole clearly in a good spot as far as our edge distance of a half inch minimum. Now what we're going to do then is to leave this in place we can't really put it in place yet because the other end is too long. So we're going to leave this exactly where it's supposed to go and then go look at the other end and essentially do the same thing and measure. And here's our final cut at the top. I used the bandsaw for that. 
and the, the dot signifies where the drilling will occur. And of course at the bottom we had the original cut we made down there. So it was just a matter of eyeballing it for the angle and then slowly trimming until it fit. Remember the distance between this surface and the surface inside here is that there's a eighth of an inch because of the base of the bracket. So that's why it looks like it's coming up a bit short at each end because otherwise it would not fit. And once you are happy with the fit and the placement of the tube, you can then drill the eighth inch into the top wall of the tube and then Clico. Do the same at both ends and Clico. And then from the bottom, we will drill up into the other side of the bracket where we made our hole and into the tube and at that point the hole will be straight through and then we're going to enlarge with a 3 16 bit straight through and enlarge all of the holes all the way down and insert a bolt and that will complete one diagonal the rest of them are very similar we just keep continuing on until we join all the brackets. Now if you notice, this one here is going beyond the center of the bracket. So that means that when we put our second tube in, we're going to run into this guy. So I've marked this tube, I'm going to pull it off and cut off the area that goes beyond the halfway point to make it a little easier to negotiate the second tube. And we want to remove and deburr. And this end then after deburring will be ready for a temporary bolt so that we can still remove it as necessary. And now we'll move on to the other end. Now for anyone struggling with getting these tube angles set up at each of the brackets, I have a little technique here, which might be useful to you, it might not, but we'll give it a shot here. So I've laid a tube across the two bracket areas at each end so that we got the angle established between the fuselage launcher on and the cross tube. Then I took a protractor and it's a little tricky to see with the camera angle here, but I set it up so that I get the same angle with the tube. And I can do that just by looking down on it and viewing it and adjusting this till I got it just right. So I'm able to easily get a pretty accurate representation of this angle, which is the angle that it meets the bracket at. Then my next step, I'm going to take a piece of leftover 1x2 
and put my tube up against it because they're basically about the same height and then I can line up my protractor and come up with the angle and then trace the angle across the tube and that makes it very easy then to take up either to your bandsaw or if this is near the end of a tube just your belt sander and make it match the line that you draw across the tube and here's an example of the protractor and the tube and so I've made that cut match and it also helps to identify what you consider the top of the tube or the side of the tube because when you make the angle at the other end it has to be in the same rotational plane as this end so let's take this back up to our bracket and this is where it's going to go now keep in mind that these brackets have a 1 8 inch base or bottom to them so I took a scrap piece and that matches up pretty good and the idea with all of this is to make sure our bolt hole gets as much stock behind it as possible and the angle is just about right for the other end and of course we'll just duplicate the procedure at the other end use our protractor to come up with the angle and then draw the angle onto the tube again it's important to mark whatever you consider the top or the side of the tube like in this case I would mark right here this is the very top so that when we go to the other end and start making uh, drawings and angle changes we don't have it cocked to one side or the other in which case it wouldn't work out very well at both ends and it was mentioned previously that when this ends up of course inside the bracket we're going to trim off this nose so that we leave room for the other tube coming in from the opposite direction and here's what the final ends look like and now we'll install them and up drill for our last diagonal we're going to run from this bracket all the way over to our gusset somewhere in the corner here and if we just put a tube up to get what the angle will look like we can pick our spot over here in the corner now I drew a line that outlines the inner edge of our fuselage tubes and of course we want this tube to extend at least a half inch beyond the place where we're going to drill a hole through so again I basically am just laying this over and picking a spot that will be centered in the tube and my spots gonna be right there and that will allow for a good half inch to go beyond the the hole and not bump into either of the tubes so somewhere in that area so we're gonna have a bolt here and then of course one at the other end in our bracket and of course we have quite a bit of space in between the two gussets and the tube isn't that thick of course so we'll end up building a uh, small bushing with the single bolt that goes all the way through after marking the hole I drilled it 1 8 inch and then the task was to find the correct location on the other gusset on the other side and there's a number of ways to do this whichever you prefer you can simply measure the distance from the top the top side of the lower tube to the side tube that's why I drew these lines and you can simply go to the other side and measure that use your millimeter ruler so 25 millimeters up 30 across or whatever you come up with and then of course another method is to use a punch pin like I did 
and very carefully get it aligned in both directions and then just like the drill press it will produce a point directly beneath. But this way you can drill two holes, not use a drill press and have it come out nicely if you take the time and do it accurately. Not difficult. So the gusset is drilled here and also drilled all the way through to the other side. I have installed my diagonal at the far end so that's installed in its bracket and so it's just pivoting here. So our goal is to be able to drill through and hit the center. Now first of all the diagonal pipe needs to be centered between these two gussets. We have two inches between the two and the pipe itself, the tube is an inch so we need about a half inch. So I came up with a way to simply hold the tube half an inch off of the bottom gusset so that it is roughly centered between the two and has a firm base at the moment and now I need to find the very center or top of the tube where it intersects. Now I want to be careful that I don't have it slid over too far one way or the other way and miss the top. One way to, to get the top is to scrape the top. And if you notice, if you scrape the very top keeping this horizontal because this is now fixed. It's not going to rotate because it is affixed in its bracket at the other end. So if I scrape the top, probably can't see that, but you get a line which shows the very, very top of the tube. So I scraped down in here and then marked it, the scrape, with my black marker. So now I can see that line very easily through the hole. So I'm simply going to drill nice and straight down until I see the line which is the very top of the tube and drill through the top wall of the tube. Then I will reverse, I'll, I'll pin this so that it can't move anymore and then go and drill up from the bottom. And then I can enlarge the holes by drilling all the way through. Keep in mind we always need to support this tube a half inch roughly from either side of the gusset because that's where it will remain centered between these two gussets. I extended the edge of our tube with this line here so that we would know where to not get the tube in trouble by extending it too far. So I can pick a point anywhere outside of that, keeping in mind that the tube will go half an inch beyond whatever bolt location I choose here, and then towards the bottom bracket. So I'm starting first with my cut to the lower bracket, and once that's in place, then the tube cannot rotate anymore, which makes it easy for drilling the other side. Here I'm working on drilling the second hole in the second gusset and I'm going to do so without using a drill press. By using tools like this, these are simply metal squares, same principle as this. The difference here is that we have a flat bottom which makes it a little easier to work with. I can line these up from two different directions, 90 degrees out of phase, and with a pin, a punch pin such as this, which fits through the hole, I can very accurately set the pin up so that it is precisely 90 degrees, and this way we can find the precise point in the lower gusset where we will get a very nice straight drill. And just like in the rear, we want to support the tube a half an inch up 
when drilling through the tube and into the hole on the other side. So we have drilled up to 3 16 for a bolt. There's got to be a better way to find the center of these tubes to help us drill accurately rather than trying to use squares or trying to carry something up to a drill press. Let's take a look at a unique idea from one of our friends. The challenges we have, uh, particularly around round tubes, uh, getting holes to go straight the way through without wandering and you get it getting a good center line. There's a couple of tubes where you actually want holes orthogonal to each other and then for many parts including the wing spars you need to get a straight line um, to get, get a, re a reference line. Um, so I ended up making um, these which are 3D printed but you can really easily make them out of wood. I just happen to be able to Having set it up, I can now make them any size, so I could make this as big as a wing spar. Um, so it's a cylinder cut out, then an eighth of an inch on each side, and then a one eighth, eighth of an inch hole centered. So if I, if I mark a hole half an inch in with a, with a ruler, all I have to do now is slide this along until it's over the mark, and now I can just punch and, and drill. If I want, if I, I could then, when I prepared earlier, Clico, and now I can just flip it over. If I wanted to start a hole on the other side, I can do that. Um, and I think having printed up four of them, because it, it's all, I, I can now move holes along that same center line any, anywhere that I've marked. And to do orthogonal holes, Again, with a clear code, one or more clear code, just flip it over, and now I've got to now align it to wherever you want the perpendicular hole, punch, and drill. And that ensures that it's absolutely 90 degrees from your original hole then? Absolutely. And then I realized, just for grins, I've got a small hole in the middle. All I need to do is draw it along, and I can make myself a center, a center line. Um, for any amount of yeah, whether I do that or might be less friction if I do it that way, but you get the idea. And that'll be very useful on the wing spar. What I'm planning to do is make a set of probably six each for the front and rear spars, so that I can have two fitted at either end, and then move have another four both to support the spar and to mark and to mark and drill at, at each station. So I, I created a, a larger version of this, one inch hole, drill, drill at either end, drill hole at, uh, in, the, in the center, um, and it's, it's, it's two inches wide, so it'll fit exactly the uh, same width as the center member. Because how do you drill a hole, how do you find um, where, you, where you're gonna center and drill through the, these, vert these um, diagonals? So put it on here, I've drilled a pilot hole where I, where I want the bolt to go through, so now all I have to do is slide it up inside, and when, there you go. What I can do is look for where the, I see the blue thing, and now um, it's now aligned. The, the center of this tube is now aligned over, over the hole, so if I now hold it in place, I can now go in and I can, part, I can either fully or part drill an eighth of an inch hole into the, into the tube knowing I've got it dead center. Exactly. Well, that's wonderful. And same at the other gusset at the far end, same principle. Yeah, this is, this is the one I took out of the, the far end. I could, I could probably got away with just making one, but you know, I just printed up two instead of one. And again, you, you can make this out, out of a piece of wood. You know, just draw across, you know, get the wood two inches, Draw, draw, join the diagonals. That's where you're going to drill your hole. Same, no. same, same on the side. Well, I'm happy. I'm happy to give away the design files to the group. Um, if you've got a 3D printer, print them. But if there's a school or the workshop that allows people access to 3D printers, you have a brother, nephew, cousin, neighbour who's got a 3D printer. Just give them the file. They'll know how to slice it and produce it for for their machine. Now, because the 
tube has to be centered between the gussets with the bolt going through. We need a half inch spacer here and on the other side. We could use a stack of washers or we could use some sort of tubing. If you have aluminum tubing or a bushing that's about a half an inch, one would go on one side of the tube and one would go on the other, but the idea is to keep the tube spaced in the center of the two gussets with the bolt going through. And here is the completed fuselage with the diagonal tubes in place. And I used AN3-15As for the bolts going through these brackets. And we'll just snug them up for now and torque them later. And there you have it. Now in the next part we're going to get started with the landing gear. We do have a few other details to attend to on the fuselage. But basically, we're going to dive right in, and we're going to get involved with wheels, axles, lots of tubing, create some more small gussets, and even cable bracing. So you don't want to miss next time. In the meantime, back to building.